Hey everyone and welcome back to Books with Spice Please. I'm Elle. And I'm Katie and in this week's episode we're going to be discussing and reviewing The Matzo Ball by Jean Meltzer. A little about this author. This is her first novel. I had seen a few things about it around. Yeah I just saw it at the Barnes and Noble looking at the holiday romances and I was like ooh this looks cute. So I grabbed it and you had it available at your library. Yeah, I was really lucky it was at the library and it was an audiobook, so it was perfect. So just remember, we are an 18 plus podcast, however, the, this is pretty tame. It's one of our tamer books. It's a super cute rom-com holiday romance, so beware. <laughs> yes, it's like a Hanukkah Hallmark movie mm-hmm. with Christmas splashed in. I loved it. Yeah, it was really cute. I liked it a lot. It is 384 pages. 10-hour audiobook. The book is written in third person, so the audiobook narrator is just one person. It doesn't switch, like, point of views and stuff. And I really liked the narrator, Dara Rosenberg. I thought she did a pretty good job. She had some character voices that was kind of sprinkled throughout that you could kind of pick up on with the context. Nice. And it is a standalone. We have not heard of another book being written yet. You want to give us the summary? Rachel Rubenstein Goldblatt is a nice Jewish girl with a shameful secret. She loves Christmas. For a decade, she's hidden her career as a Christmas romance novelist from her family. Her talent has made her a bestseller, even as her chronic illness has always kept the kind of love she writes about out of reach. But when her diversity-conscious publisher insists she write a Hanukkah romance, her well of inspiration suddenly runs dry. Hanukkah's not magical. It's not Mary. It's not Christmas. Desperate not to lose her contract, Rachel's determined to find her muse at the matzah ball, a Jewish music celebration on the last night of Hanukkah, even if it means working with her summer camp arch enemy, Jacob Greenberg. Though Rachel and Jacob haven't seen each other since they were kids, Their grudge still glows brighter than a menorah, but as they spend more time together, Rachel finds herself drawn to Hanukkah and Jacob in a way she never expected. Maybe this holiday of lights will be the spark she needed to get her heart ablaze. So our main character, Rachel Rubenstein Goldblatt, she's the main female character. She's Jewish, daughter of the world famous rabbi. She secretly writes Christmas romances under the pen name Margot Cross. She suffers from chronic fatigue syndrome and it's taken a big toll on her life, but she doesn't like to tell people she's sick and keeps it a secret from mostly everyone except for the people closest to her. So I believe not even her agent knows that she has chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah, she's had experiences in the past where people thought that she just needed to drink a lot of coffee or she should get more sleep. And while all of those things might help a little bit, it doesn't solve her problem. She's ill, so she is hard to open up about it because people can be cruel. Mm -hmm. Jacob Greenberg is our male main character. He met Rachel at Jewish summer camp, Camp Ahava. He only attended summer camp one year when he was 12 because he moved with his mother to France after that camp summer. And he was like a new kid at camp. Like everyone was like, ooh, he's the new guy. So he really stuck out. And he and Rachel had a little bit of a thing during that summer, like sneaking out, doing pranks with each other and stuff like that. So it was a cute little 12 year old middle school romance. It was so cute. (laughs) And then there's Mickey who is Rachel's best friend. And also he attended Camp Ahava as well with both of them. He knows all the details of the drama between Rachel. He's been best friends with Rachel since before then, too. So he's been through it all. And then there's Toby, Jacob's grandma, his father's mom. She's 91 years old, and she's still super active, traveling the world and stuff. And she was a Holocaust survivor. Yeah, she was such a hoot, and I loved her character a lot. Yeah, she was so vibrant. Like, she was like our fairy godmother type character. She kind of helped both of our main love interests see the light and, like, pushed them together. Mm Mm-hmm. And then you have Dr. Rubenstein, Rachel's mom, who is a well-known OBGYN in New York City. She's also a really good mom. I think like just the way that Jacob describes her and the way that Rachel describes her. Very like obviously motherly, but she's kind of 
a tad bit overbearing, but not in a bad way. And no. she's just really funny the way she gives her daughter a hard time and like also tries to push her towards Jacob. I know. So this kind of ties into her dad being the rabbi, mm-hmm. Rabbi Aaron Goldblatt, and he's world famous. So, I mean, they're Jewish, guys. It's awesome. I think that the way that the culture is portrayed was really cute and wholesome and I think that it was a really good dip in the toe for people who aren't experienced with Judaism and it reminded me a lot of Worst Best Man how the culture was mixed into the story. I definitely learned a lot about Hanukkah as a holiday and it was just really fun and it was cute and funny. It was cool. So Rachel's mother drops by unexpectedly and announces she invited Jacob Greenberg to the Shabbat dinner that coming Friday and he was in town for an event that he's throwing and she wanted Rachel to attend the dinner too. So Rachel's pretty shook that she mentioned Jacob Greenberg of all people to go to the dinner. It had been 18 years since she had seen him, but she still hadn't forgiven him for turning her first kiss with him into a prank. There was a bunch of boys with their camera and hiding in bushes that kind of jumped out and took pictures and recorded them while they were having their first kiss. And she's like, that was a huge moment in my life that was just completely ruined and treated like a joke. But after that, Mickey, her best friend, drops by. And so her mom kind of makes her exit, thankfully, because he brings a little Santa minifigure that she had been trying to collect for years. It's then that her office is revealed to the reader. It's completely decked out in Christmas decor. And she has these little mini Santa figures that she's been collecting for years in a line all across her desk. And she was super stoked to get that one that Mickey had because he was super rare. Yeah, he picked it up from the post office for her because she was saving up her energy. Later on in the book, she talks about her Santas again, and she's got like 200 of these little Santas. She's been collecting in her Christmas office. She has a train that goes off every single hour and goes all the way around her office. I love it. It sounds so magical. I know. I loved it too. She has to keep it a secret from her mom because her mom would be so mad. And there's a point in the book where she reminisces about a time when Rachel was growing up and she tried to like cut out a construction Christmas tree to tape to her wall and her mom tore it down and was like no we are Jewish we don't celebrate Christmas and it's a really big thing for her parents because they're trying to conserve their religion and not lose it they've lost so much during the holocaust it's really serious yeah so she was going to try and tell her parents that she's writing christmas romance novels and then she's like nope jk not doing that i'm gonna break their hearts so she's got her pen name which i think is adorable yeah i like it a lot too but rachel has a meeting with her publisher that's what she had been saving up her energy for and it does not go as she had planned or hoped they rejected her ideas for her she had like five christmas book ideas already lined up and they rejected all of her ideas and they were like we want a hanukkah romance and she's like what we've never done this before and like it said in the description they're like trying to branch out from just christmas and they figured that this would be a perfect opportunity for her to come out as herself writing a novel instead of a pen name and they're like excited and what do you think and they tell her to come back with some ideas and (laughs) she understand how she's gonna write a Hanukkah romance because there's just not the same magic and wonder that Christmas has and she's really worried that she's not gonna have any ideas I know and she's like trying to figure out a way to tell these non-Jewish women it's not the same but yeah (laughs) she's like I would know better than anybody that there's just nothing to write about here yeah (laughs) And they're like, dig deep. You got this. If anyone's got this, is you. So on the train back, she sees a newspaper and on it is an advertisement for the Matzo Ball Max. And it's an exclusive event celebrating on the last night of Hanukkah. It was being put together by none other Jacob Greenberg. So she decides to go to dinner after all to try and talk to Jacob about getting herself a ticket. She thinks the event could be an inspiration that she needs to write a Hanukkah romance. Yeah, she's really desperate to get some ideas. (laughs) And so Jacob gets to the house 
before Rachel does, he's there for Shabbat dinner, thinking about how his mother's death had really brought him back to his Jewish roots and how he really values his identity. They were about to start the candle lighting when Rachel bursts through the door. There's like a certain time that you have to like have the candles lit by. And so he offers Rachel's parents two tickets to the matzo ball max in the honor of lighting the candles and giving the final blessing on the eighth night of Hanukkah and everyone's like super jazzed they're like this is exciting can't believe what you're doing for the Jewish community we're bringing everybody together this is gonna bring you know lots of eyes on us and it's gonna be great and then after dinner he's worried that he's done something to upset Rachel because she was acting kind of odd when he handed over the tickets to her parents she was like whoa I want one and he was like well I can't get you one he explains too that like they don't have any tickets left it's completely sold out he has to have a limit on numbers of people they allow in for safety reasons like fire code and that he just didn't have any more tickets like there's 3,000 people on the waiting list (laughs) so she's like really pressed she's like dang I really need one of those tickets Yeah, she was like, that's my lifeline. After dinner, he's worried that he's done something to upset Rachel because of how odd she had been acting after she had learned all that information. And he thinks about when she had broke his heart at camp and didn't answer any of his phone calls or letters after camp was over. At this point, I was like, oh, so they both had their heart broken. I wonder what happened in his point of view. He broke her heart. What? (laughs) Yeah, how did he not know about the prank that was life ruining? I know. Maybe he was just like a silly kid and just was like, yeah, (laughs) first kiss, no big deal. I don't know. (laughs) After dinner and everyone goes home, everybody goes to bed and Rachel gets up to go to the bathroom and accidentally walks in on Jacob getting ready to shower. She takes that as the time to ask again for the ticket to the ball and he tells her that the only way she can get a ticket is if she were to volunteer and he has one spot left for a volunteer and the volunteers get to go to the ball. She agrees to volunteer the eight days with him before the event to get her ticket. And she knew it was going to be a bad idea because of her chronic fatigue syndrome. She was dead set on not telling him about her illness because she's scared to tell people she's scared of what he's going to think of her and she would rather take her chances but in the morning Jacob goes downstairs to find Dr. Rubenstein and she starts talking to him. She tells him that she's sorry that his mother had passed and he thinks that Dr. Rubenstein is really comforting and he thinks about his mom and it's very sad and he never told anyone not even Rachel that his home life with his dad and his mom being so sick was really hard Dr. Rubenstein could tell that Jacob needed a hug and they had he had like a mom hug you know yeah that's the thing too his life when he was 12 at that time when he had met Rachel His dad abandoned them pretty much. That's why they moved to France, back to where his mom was from. And he hadn't seen his dad really since he had lived in France for 18 years. Mm -hmm. Ever since he'd been to New York last. So then we have the next plot point. Rachel's on her way home from visiting her parents in Long Island and she decides to make a detour. She visits Santa and he's absolutely not thrilled. And there's a quote from Santa saying, Lady, Santa said, not at all, Jolly. I told you a thousand times, I'm not a therapist. But she just is like, yeah, I know, but this is cheaper than therapy. She asks for a happy ending of her own. I thought that was really cute. And that's like such a little hallmark moment. (laughs) I know. I absolutely adored it. She, like, got her picture taken. The picture was, like, on her desk for the rest of the book. Like, she she would look over at her desk and she was like, and I saw the picture of me with Santa from a few days ago. And I remember happier times. (laughs) More hopeful. (laughs) Santa always made her feel better. He was always there for her. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my god, it was so funny because he did not feel the same towards her at all. (laughs) He saw her and was ready to like, oh my god, not this lady again. (laughs) Yeah. Um, She goes so often. Yeah. (laughs) And she paid $50 too. I was like, oh my gosh. And waited in line. Mm -hmm. That was so good. 
So Rachel gets home and she tells Mickey about the truce she made with Jacob and how she's going to volunteer for the ticket to the Motsball Max. Mickey's like, did you tell him that you're sick? And she was like, no. And he was like, you need to tell him that you're sick. And she's like, I'm going to be fine. We're going to get through this. So she knows, like she knows and she's been told, right? Mm -hmm. And she gets there on her first day to the Mossa Ball and like Jacob is so excited like he is so excited to spend more time with Rachel and to like start up their old antics from camp and he makes this horrible Mossa Ball costume out of a like baseball mascot and it's like covered in paint and like actual Mossa Balls like glued on it's horrific looking and <laughs> yeah and heavy <laughs> terribly heavy and she sees it and he's like here you go first day you're gonna wear this mods ball costume and hand out flyers and she's like mm, okay I guess I guess so like she does not back down no she doesn't want to at first either because he tries to tell him no and he's like I guess I'll just go you know find someone else who will and give them the ticket <laughs> So she's like, okay, fine. I need this goddamn ticket. Yeah. And Jacob has a entertainment, like, music festival business. So he has a bunch of investors. And he's having a meeting with his investors just after he puts Rachel in this poor matzo ball costume. And they're like, what is up with this matzo ball thing in the front? Like, why is that here? <laughs> that, that does not scream classy establishment. <laughs> and Jacob's like... <laughs> Yeah, I get that. But it's for the children. It's for the children. And they're like, are you sure? He's like, yeah. And she ends up getting turned into a meme. And all the investors are like happy that she's a meme. <laughs> because they want social media exposure for their event. Yeah. <laughs> and she's so mad. I know. And then he doesn't tell her what she's doing the next day. And she arrives the next day to ready to volunteer and she's made to watch a bunch of the little kids for the they're the children of the attendees that have gone on a little retreat for the day i was so mad for her at that point because she's still in costume and it sounded horrible horrible the children were snotty children <laughs> they really were they did not listen no they didn't at all and when she rolled down into the giant menorah knocking it all over she was covered in jelly donuts that the children had been throwing at her so jacob thought that she had been bleeding and he was trying to get an ambulance called to the scene <laughs> to help them out and she was like no i'm fine it's fine she like took a couple calming breaths and she gets proper mad and rips off her matzo ball costume tells him off like she doesn't know what games he's playing, but he's done making fun of her. Mm -hmm. Mickey shows up later that evening to tell Jacob off and to let him know that Rachel's sick and gets very, very tired. And he doesn't tell her, tell him specifically what Rachel has because he knows that Rachel wouldn't want him to and that he wouldn't want him to tell Jacob in the first place that she's sick. But when he wouldn't confirm, like, if it was cancer or heart disease or anything like that, Jacob just knew right away that it was chronic illness. And there's a quote I liked. Then Jacob knew. He knew because Mickey hesitated. He knew because while people wore ribbons for cancer or marched for heart disease, they hid chronic illness. Which I think is very true. Yeah. Jacob goes back to his bubby, Grandma Toby, and she reassures him that he's not like his dad. And with her help, he realizes that he's come back to New York all this time to confront all of the hurt that he had as a child with Rachel and his father. He knew he had to do. He like was having all of these realizations about his behavior and how he had been reaching out to people kind of in the wrong way. And he goes to his father's office the next morning and stands up to him realizing that he's just kind of a huge asshole and he felt so much better after confronting his dad like his dad had got remarried and acted like they 
we're old friends. Like, that was, like, the front that he had given off at first. And then he was like, why are you actually here, Jacob? Like, what? And Jacob's like, you know what? I was just here to prove to myself, pretty much, that I don't need you. Was yeah. the vibe. And he's nothing like his dad, which was very reassuring to him. Yeah. So, one of the things that Jacob remembered when his mom was dealing with her illness was that people were quick to give solutions and they were not quick to actually help. So he took it upon himself to hire an assistant and fly her in on his private jet from Paris to help Rachel get her house cleaned up and take care of her so she can rest. And Rachel nicknames her Martha Poppins because her name is Martha. And she's like Mary Poppins because she just gets everything done like magic. Mm -hmm. She even hires a chef that cooks for her and makes sure everything is kosher. It really just gives her the opportunity to focus on herself and her health. And Rachel tried refusing the help at first, but I thought Martha was kind of like a little bulldog to me and refuses. It was so funny because Rachel was like, no, you're from Jacob. (laughs) Like, I don't need your help. And... Ultimately, she gives in and accepts the help, and it really helps her with a much speedier recovery. Yeah, and she's able to get her manuscript started. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And her manuscript, she got inspired, finally, with all of this moss ball craziness, to write a story titled The Hanukkah Grinch. Yep. She's excited about that project, and she is building up steam. (laughs) And then the next day, Jacob shows up with a bedazzled wheelchair for Rachel and hopes that she will go with him to the Empire State Building. She also receives a ticket to the ball from him, and he tells her that she doesn't need to volunteer anymore and how sorry he was. And she was impressed. She thought for a second, like, maybe he was just pitying her. But she ultimately let her illness decide for her that she was just too sick to go. And she shuts the door on him and starts crying. Yeah, she felt like that was just her life. Like, it was keeping her from everything. And she was just too tired. Mm -hmm. Later that day, she was kind of beating up herself. And Mickey was visiting her, listening to her talk like that. And he just started scolding her. Why do you do that? She's like, what? Constantly act like you don't have the same value as other people. And then he goes on to her rant about how amazing she is, how worthy and pretty much how it wouldn't change if she were stuck in bed for years. She would still just be as amazing and worthy of the love she's getting from her friends and family now and from receiving it from, you know, new people like Jacob. Yeah. While Mickey is there giving her this pep talk she gets a package from jacob and it's a gorgeous navy blue ball gown with a note asking her to be his date and it says please don't stand me up like you did last time at the bottom of his note and she's like what's that about i don't know what that is yeah mickey's confused too because she doesn't ever remember time at like camp ahava ahava yeah standing- ahava. yeah it's standing him up so they're like okay that's weird um she says she's going to decline, and then Mickey confesses that Jacob hadn't set her up at all during camp all those years ago, and it had been him the whole time. He felt so bad, but he was like, I'm such a jealous kid, and I missed my best friend. So when I heard about the kiss, he told everyone, and they got him to hide and prank them both, and he never revealed it. And he was, like, thankful that Jacob had left, because he wouldn't have to reveal it that next summer, you know? Yeah, and he got his friend all back to himself. Mm-hmm. So it worked. <laughs> yeah. Rachel decides to go back to volunteer the next day because she's feeling better, and she uses the wheelchair that he bedazzled for her. He gives her a job that doesn't cause too much stress on her body, and at the end of the day, she overhears Jacob panicking to Shmuel about the decor and how cheap everything looks and how they have to cancel because... The people at their venue are expecting a high class event. Like they've paid a lot of money. They've waited a lot of time. Like this event is supposed to be super fancy. And he's worried that it's just not looking right. Rachel comes in and she saves the day. 
She tells them to go get some rest and to get her some coffee and dinner. And she just like, handles the rest of it. And the next morning, Jacob comes in. He's surprised that so much has gotten done and how beautiful everything is turning out. She said that he had been missing the magic that Christmas brings. And so she brought an extra sparkle to Hanukkah. She hired an acrobat to perform in the air as dreidels. And she had lights and scarves everywhere and completely changed everything for the better. And Jacob invites her back to his grandma's apartment for Rugelot. And she accepts and they have a few pieces of this, like, it seems like a pastry, like a chocolate pastry. Yeah, I've never had it before. Sounds good though. Yeah, me neither. There's so much food in this book that I was like, I feel like I never try anything new. I need to try more new stuff. Yeah, same. (laughs) (laughs) But they're having a blast and she's got a sugar high and she's running around and he had never seen her so active. And he insists on taking her back to her apartment and they have their first kiss. And it says, she kissed him. No explanation, no warning. She leaned into him, grabbing him by the neck, pulling him forward. He nearly doubled over in shock at the feeling of her lips finally meeting. And then he melted. And I thought this was like a Grinch moment because she's writing about the Grinch and she's like melting him, you know, with the kiss and like bringing joy to the season. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I see what you mean. I hear what you're throwing down. (laughs) I thought it was so cute. She invites him up to her apartment and he discovers her secret Christmas office while she's getting changed and getting some wine for them. And he laughs when he discovers that she's actually Margot Cross because he sees one of her writer's awards on the wall. Like he walked in the office and he was like, oh, dang, this girl is a fan of Christmas. And then he's like, dang, she loves Margot Cross. And then he's like, oh, she is Margot Cross. He sees her manuscript for the Hanukkah Grinch on her desk. And he's like, oh, and he sits down and starts reading it. (laughs) <laughs> and he's it's not good it's very much about him and the character's name is even jason goldstein so it's it's not too far from his own name yeah <laughs> he was even a multimillionaire and a party planner in her book so he's pretty upset <laughs> which i thought was pretty fair mm-hmm, definitely and- Yeah, like, that's kind of a shock. And he felt like he had, you know, like, they were kind of making amends. He's realizing that this is the only reason why Rachel even wanted a ticket in the first place. And she sees that he's in her office. She's panicking. And he's like, I want you to be honest with me. Like, what is your job? Like, who is Margot Cross? And she really wants to be honest with him. But she's just too scared of revealing her secret identity. (laughs) We haven't even mentioned her movies. She has Christmas movies. Mm -hmm. She's got like four Christmas movies and like 20 something books. Yeah. She's like a full time author, right? Yeah. For just Christmas romances. Yeah. (laughs) So she's got a whole career. Like this is her career. She's scared. I mean, I would be too. And he's like, I can't do this if you're not going to be honest with me. And he leaves and she's like totally heartbroken. It's terrible. And then the next day, that evening, she's drinking alone. She's super sad. The start of the matzo ball when she decides to go ahead and put on the dress that Jacob had sent for her to wear as her date back when they were getting along, you know. And Toby (laughs) knocks on the door and she stops by and she convinces Rachel to fight for Jacob. She's like, do you love him? Does he spark feelings inside of you? Does he make you happy? And... She's like, yeah, I think so. And he's like, then fight for him. Show him. And Rachel's like, you're right. Before she can think twice about it, she puts on her sneakers and like runs out the door. She didn't have her purse or her things or like her wallet or anything and didn't go back. Toby had given Rachel some earrings that she had carried with her through the Holocaust, and she had used the stones inside of these earrings, the precious gemstones inside of them to like pay off people to let her go. And so she could run away and escape. It was what had given Rachel her courage to fight for what she wanted because the history that these earrings represented Toby's like fighting spirit for so long. And then she still had them. And the stones inside of them have been replaced with glass 
they just were beautiful. And anyway, so she wears those earrings and feels empowered to run after Jacob. She had given her ticket to Mickey. So when she tries to get in, going through the security at the entrance, they're like, nope, you're not on our list. You don't have a ticket. Go wait with everybody else. So she tries to sneak her way in and has to run away from security. She, like, climbs. Oh, my God. It's a scene, okay? She has to drop the matzo ball down, the the mask, the huge thing. That yeah, she the matzo ball costume. Yeah, the costume to, like, kind of cause a scene. The security guards notice her, and she realizes she's kind of cornered and sees Jacob going onto the stage. So she runs right on stage to Jacob, right before the candle lighting was supposed to happen, and, like, begs him to call off the security because she's afraid to get tasered. And she stands there on stage in front of everybody and professes her love for him. And he doesn't say anything at first. So she begins to leave and is in the crowd when he shouts her name. And it's like that movie. I think you mentioned this out. Never been kissed at the mm-hmm. end where the teacher's like shouts her name. Yes. And stop. I love you too in front of everybody. Oh, and so- he says, I really like this quote. It was cute. Because you stood me up at Camp Ahava dance 18 years ago. And I'd be a damn fool to ever let you walk out on me again. And kisses her. Yes, so so sweet. I was like listening to this book, and when this moment happened, I honest like I almost started crying, and I was just like, "This is just like my one of my favorite movies." I ah, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. It was exactly. It had the same exact vibes. Yeah. And I think it's so important to impress, like, this girl, like, she's chronic fatigue syndrome, but she ran her ass all the way to the matzo ball max from her apartment. She didn't have her phone on her. She didn't have her wallet. So she couldn't take a taxi or anything like that. So she ran. And then she's doing all these maneuvers to get away from security. And then she's running up on stage. And it's craziness. She probably like got herself real sick after that honestly yeah (laughs) i was so worried the whole time like that like she was just gonna crash or something i like i don't know how it works obviously like fully but oh my gosh the whole time i was like dang this girl is special ops all of a sudden for him and she fought (laughs) yeah she put her all into it it was so impressive Mm mm-hmm but that is like where the book ends off. And then there's the epilogue. Jacob and Rachel are engaged to get married. And she publishes her Hanukkah romance under her own name called The Matzo Ball. And then the last page of the story is an email to her mother asking that she has any recommendations for a trusted OBGYN in the city. Surprise, baby. Well, it's not really a surprise, but baby. <laughs> yes. It's also really cute at the at the matzo ball max when her mom and dad are like, "Yeah, we knew you were a Christmas author." They, they were, were waiting, waiting for you for to tell her us. The courage to tell them herself. And I was like, "Oh my god, what?" <laughs> they were waiting for her to come out. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and that is the matzo ball by Jean Lutzer. So, do you think that Jacob was a book boyfriend, a book husband, or a garbage can? Um, not for me. He's not a garbage can, obviously. He's a good, he's a good character, but I just didn't really feel anything, you know? So he's Mm -hmm. not for me, but he's definitely right for Rachel. Yeah. I thought that he was a sweet guy, too, but he, like, obviously needed to work together with Rachel and not assume that she's having a good time and, you know, pranking her all the time. And so I thought that, like, I'd be willing to try to make it work. So, like, maybe he would be a book boyfriend. But he definitely wouldn't be book husband material. Yeah, no. That's for sure. Not yet. Not yet. (laughs) Yeah. And then what was your spice rating? There was not any spice. There were, like, two kisses and that was it. Yeah, it was very Insinuation of, like, him carrying her back to the bed. Like, they were going to have sex. But, you know, that's okay. Sex doesn't need to be in every book we read. Still a good book. Yeah, zero pepper spice, but still a romance. It is. And what did you review this book? 
I gave it a four star. It was a really good read, and I recommend it to anybody and everybody who likes holiday romances. Like, it uh, didn't, didn't make me cry. wasn't super, you know, profound, but I liked it a lot. It was good. Yeah, it was a five-star book for me. I really, really love this book. I started listening to it, and I couldn't stop. Like, it was almost like the sweetest obsession, except for this one just kept me smiling and laughing the whole time. It, it was a ha- super heartwarming story. I loved it. It was cute. Yeah, like it wasn't super rom com y, but it was definitely rom com, you know? Like, yeah, I loved it. I thought it was a good five star, five star for sure <laughs> book for me. I think that kind of wraps it up. Yeah, thanks for listening. You can join us next Tuesday when we read Cowboys for Christmas Moose Ranch by Jan Springer. We are live on Instagram every Wednesday for Wine and Spice Wednesdays to discuss that week's podcast and chat with everybody. You can also find us on TikTok, Facebook, anywhere you can find podcasts, the WeTube, YouTube. We've got most of it. We each have our own Goodreads. (laughs) Do not forget to like, comment, subscribe. We'd love to hear feedback. So all the engagement things, talking with you and seeing what you think about these books and topics are, why we are here. We will see you next week. Until then, stay spicy. spicy.